This episode of Ask a Spaceman is brought to you by Skillshare. Yes, my friends at Skillshare, it's an online learning community with thousands of classes for people like you and uh, like me. Honestly, it's a cool resource for me too. You can explore new skills, you can deepen some passions, and you can just get lost, which is always super fun. I especially recommend some categories along the lines of freelance and entrepreneurship, web development, productivity, to just get your awesome, creative, game-changing idea off the ground, especially the class Pricing Your Work, How to Value Your Work as a Freelancer by Peggy Dean. Valuable, valuable resource for helping you understand just how to how to charge for the awesome work that you do. And, and you deserve to make money, if I do say so myself. Look, uh, Skillshare is curated for learning, which means there are no ads, they're always adding new classes and you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. And it's less than 10 bucks a month with a premium subscription. Speaking of subscriptions, the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description of this video will get a free trial of premium membership so you can just do it. Neutrinos. Neutrinos are the worst particle in the universe. They're the worst. I, I, neutrinos annoy me. Neutrinos give me a headache. I mean, and they've given everyone a headache since they were first discovered. They weren't even discovered on purpose. They, they were discovered on accident when we we're looking at something called beta decay, where we realized that a neutron in a nucleus transforms into a proton and electron. It just decays. It just changes. And this is uh, triggers a lot of radioactive decay. When we were looking at these kinds of reactions way back in like the 1920s, we we're looking at these reactions, we realized that the energy and momentum that the original neutron had was not matched up by the total energy and momentum of the proton and electron that, that came out. It just didn't add up. So something had to, to give. And what we came up with was the existence of a new particle that was involved in this reaction, but stole away some of the energy and momentum, and yet we couldn't directly see it. We knew it had to be neutrally charged, like no charge at all. And we knew that because uh, the proton and the electron that came out, a positive and negative, that balanced the electrical charge coming into the reaction, which was a neutral neutron. So you can't just add or create electric charges. We knew it had to be tiny because these differences in energy and momentum were just very, very tiny. And we knew it couldn't interact with the electromagnetic force because you know, we would have seen it. So we came up with like a cute name for it, a neutrino. Little neutral one. It's Italian for little neutral one. And that's like when a particle gets a name as, as half of a joke, you know it's just going to be bad news. Now, neutrinos by themselves. So so they were introduced in the 1930s and then discovered a couple decades later, experimentally verified. Like, yep, yeah, we've got neutrinos. There's this new kind of particle, which is annoying, but we can deal with it. And it took part in all sorts of reactions. But then we discovered that there are different flavors of neutrinos. Uh, another word for flavor here is species. The most common word that physicists use is flavor. I don't know why. When species or kind or type would work better, but here we are. We discovered there are more flavors of neutrinos. And this went along with the discovery that there are different flavors of the electron. So you have uh, your electron has its charge, has its mass, has its spin. It does all of its electron things. There is a version of the electron that has the exact same electric charge, exact same spin, behaves exactly like the electron does, except it has a much heavier mass we call it the muon. And that's a different kind of electron. It's like the, like the older sibling of the electron. And then we discovered that there is a third type or flavor or species called the tau particle, which is like the electron and the muon, but heavier still. So to go along with these three flavors of electrons, there are three flavors of neutrinos. There is the electron neutrino, 
the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. And these flavors pair up. So if you have some sort of complicated physics interaction going on at the subatomic level, if there are electrons involved in the reaction, you're going to get electron neutrinos along with it. If there are tau particles, you're going to get the tau neutrinos. And if there are muons, you're going to get the muon neutrinos. So they pair up flavor to flavor. Then there's the whole antimatter thing. So not only are there the neutrinos in the three kinds, there are three kinds of anti-neutrinos. So like that's six new particles to add to the universe, which is super annoying because that's a lot of bookkeeping. That's a lot to keep track of. These neutrinos are weird. For a long time, we thought they have no mass, but I'll get into that in a little bit. They only interact via the weak nuclear force. So they don't participate in the strong nuclear force. They don't participate in electromagnetic. Yes, technically they participate in gravity because everything partic participates in gravity, but like it's so barely there, it doesn't even count. It's just the weak nuclear force. The only way to see a neutrino is with the weak nuclear force, which is super weak and super short range. And, and that's a whole other set of headaches right there, the weak nuclear force. And you got these six particles that we've had to add to the, the table of the list of particles in the universe. But we were kind of sort of able to deal with that. Like, okay, fine, there are more particles. But then in the 1960s with the Homestake experiment, we were detecting neutrinos produced by the sun. Neutrinos, anytime there's like a nuclear reaction, neutrinos are somehow involved. They always get in the way of things. And, and the sun is a giant nuclear reactor, so it's constantly spitting out neutrinos. And we know from nuclear physics of what's happening inside the core of the sun that it spits out electron type neutrinos, electron neutrinos. But then when we went to measure this, the actual amount of neutrinos bombarding the earth, and there are like trillions of neutrinos passing through your body right now, by the way. Uh, we So we built this big detector and it only saw like a third to a half of the neutrinos that we knew that the sun was creating. So that was a problem. That was way back in the 1960s. It took a long time for us to come up with an answer. And the answer is so annoying. The answer to why is the sun, when we know the sun is producing this many neutrinos, but we only see half of them or a third of them, we did constant double checks like, no, we are getting the physics of the sun right. We do understand nuclear reactions. We know it's producing electron neutrinos. We, we know the distance. Like we double checked everything. And then we started to build some other kinds of experiments. And we realized that neutrinos do one of the most annoying things possible, which is change identity, identity as they travel. Neutrinos can do something that we call mixing. If I were to have an electron neutrino gun, and I were to shoot you with the electron neutrino gun. As these electron neutrinos travel, some of them would just, will just transform into muon neutrinos or tau neutrinos, and then maybe back to electron neutrinos and then back into muon. And so by the time they hit you, some of them will be electrons, some of them will be tau, some of them will be muon neutrinos. And if your detector is only set up, if your body is only set up to detect electron-type neutrinos, then all the muons and tau neutrinos are just going to sail right by you. You're not set up to see it. Once we were able to set our, up our experiments to see this kind of thing, we saw all the neutrinos all over the place. But this neutrino mixing is weird. There are, there are a couple other particles that do this in the universe, but not the ones that you interact with on a daily basis. Not ones flying through your body right now. And the fact that neutrinos can mix, that they can shift their identities, led us to conclude that neutrinos have mass. The way it works is that what we call an electron neutrino or a tau neutrino or a muon neutrino isn't the entire story. There are these three flavors of neutrinos. There are also three masses of neutrinos. The physicists label them M1, M2, and M3, which is not very helpful or descriptive or flowery, but at least it's simple and straightforward. There are three flavors of neutrinos and three masses of neutrinos. And the flavors and the masses do not line up. They do not describe the same thing, which is, I mean, come on, who does this? 
Who does this? Like if, if you look at an electron, you have the charge of the electron. You have the flavor of the electron. You have the mass of the electron. And that's it. You name any one of those things and you completely describe that you know who you're talking talking about. You're talking about the electron. Same as the top quark. Same as the neutron. Same whatever particle you want. But the neutrino, the flavor and the mass do not line up. If I say, here's a tau neutrino, it's really a combination of the three masses of neutrinos, the three mass identities of the neutrino. If I give you an electron neutrino, it's really a mixture of the three mass identities, a different mixture, but still a mixture of M1, M2, and M3 combined together to give you the electron neutrino. They combine together in a different way to give you the muon neutrino, combine together in a different way to give you the tau neutrino. It also works in reverse. Like if I were to somehow to give you like, here's an M1 neutrino, ta-da. It's really a mixture of the electron, the muon, and the tau neutrinos blending together to give you the M1. These, the flavor identities and the mass identities do not line up. No other particle that you interact with on a daily basis acts like that. The kaon does, in case you're wondering, but we're not going to talk about the kaon today. And so that's the reason, the reason we think they have mass is the three mass identities. They have the different masses. M1 is different than M2 and it's different than M3. They travel through space at slightly different speeds. And so they like phase in and out of each other as they travel. Like sometimes M1 is a little bit stronger. You know, sometimes M2 is a little bit, sometimes M3. And depending on the ratio of the masses, it's that changes what you detect. So if there's a certain ratio of M1, M2, and M3, you might get an electron neutrino. But if you put, take your detector and move it back like a foot, then the neutrinos can travel another extra foot and change their identity just a little bit because the ratios of masses will be a little bit different. Now it's a town, you don't see it at all. <sighs> the fact that neutrinos have mass is a huge problem. Huge. We can't, un we can't explain it. And there's the reason we can't explain it is there's one other property of neutrinos that I haven't told you about yet. Yeah, this is, this, I told you neutrinos are the worst because it just keeps getting worse and worse. Every, uh, every particle has something we call a handedness or a helicity or, or somewhat equivalent, a chirality. There's various words that we associate with this. Like if, if, if I shot you with a bullet, I know there's a lot of violence involved in this episode. Please forgive me. If I shot with you with a bullet and the bullet is spinning, it can spin in one direction as it's flying to you, or it can spin in, in the opposite direction as it's flying to you. It doesn't care. We call one of these arrangements right-handed and the other arrangement left-handed. Okay. Every single particle as it travels can spin in one direction or the other as it travels. Who cares? There's right-handed versions and left-handed versions. Neutrinos only come in left-handed form. That's right. Every single neutrino that we've ever observed is only left-handed. Its spin is always in the opposite direction as its direction of travel. Every anti-neutrino, by the way, is always right-handed. Why is this a problem? Well, particles, all particles in physics don't have mass on their own. They instead acquire mass by interacting with something called the Higgs field. The Higgs field permeates all the space of time, space and time. The particles start talking to the Higgs field and the Higgs field says, yeah, you can have some mass. Here's some mass for you, electron. Here's some mass for you, top quark, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That actual interaction, in order to get the math work out and all the symmetries to go right, the Higgs field has to talk to both right-handed and left-handed versions of the particles. So you're like, okay, we got a right-handed electron over here and a left-handed electron over here. Okay, I'm going to talk to both of you at the same time and I'm going to give both of you mass and you're going to go on with um, about your day. So if the neutrino is only left-handed, there's no right-handed version of the neutrino. There's nothing for the Higgs, bos the Higgs field to talk to. And so the neutrino can't acquire mass 
by talking to the Higgs field because it doesn't have its opposite handed counterpart. And yet the neutrino has mass. Do you see why I have a headache now? The explanation for why neutrinos have mass is beyond our current understanding of physics. It could be, it could be that there is a right-handed version of the neutrino, but for some reason it has some incredibly high mass and so we never see it in our experiments and it never interacts with us on a daily basis. We call this a sterile neutrino. Like it's even less of a neutrino than a neutrino is and that's saying a lot. In which case, okay, you got your left-handed, you got your right-handed, you use the Higgs boson mechanism, Higgs field mechanism, you get some mass, but we happen to not see the, uh, the opposite-handed counterpart. It could be that neutrinos are their own antiparticle, in which case there are some mathematical ways in order to give it mass. This is called the Majorana mass, if you're curious. It could be both. There could be like right-handed versions and the neutrino could be its its an own antiparticle, in which case neutrinos would occasionally collide and blow each other up, but they so rarely interact, it like never happens. Honestly, we don't know. Honestly, we, we don't know. And this is why neutrinos are the worst particle in the universe. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Please go to patreon.com slash pmsutter, like, share, subscribe. And, and I just need a break from neutrinos.